Hello there, it's Jay here from Jay's Vintage Junk, and as you can see, I have removed the chassis from the um, Pi Television. Now, um, for basically what we're going to do in this video, um, now I've actually got the chassis out of the TV, and I must admit that was incredibly easy to do. Essentially, all you've got to do is remove, uh, remove the back from the um, television, then remove two um, screws, Unplug the um, audio output transformer and the speaker, which is just on one little plug, and then the entire chassis just lifts out of the case. I couldn't really get it much much easier than that, really. <coughs> and I'm really, really pleased with how this looks. It doesn't actually appear that anyone has ever really worked on this set. I can't see I, from a quick initial look over. I can't see any previous work on it, which is quite unbelievable considering this TV. I found out this TV is actually from 1949. Um, I said it is either the um, LV20 or the BV20. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to find out actually in this video which one um, which one it is. But like I said, um, initial look is really good. The only thing is, it is incredibly, and I do mean incredibly dirty. Um, I mean, look at my hands, and that's just from lip lifting it out of the case and carrying it upstairs. Um, I'm filthy. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, basically, is just do a, a basic clean of it. Uh, we're going to be as careful as possible. We don't want to disturb anything. But I just can't work on it in this. In, I mean, look at this. This is the screen. That's, you know, uh, we can't work on it in this state. So, like I said, the first thing I'm going to do is just start cleaning it up and as we clean it up we can go around it and have a look at a few things assess some of the things that we're going to actually have to do on this set uh, what I'm going to use initially is actually this stuff it's just like a general purpose um, cleaner um, I use the solid the, basically this comes in a liquid or a solid version and the solid version of this is a bit like um, a very mild abrasive it's fantastic for cleaning up like PVC and things like that but the um, the liquid version it's more of like a, a general purpose cleaner and it's very good glass cleaner and this is great just for um, getting the worst of the muck off so we'll just put a little bit on like that I mean there's plenty of products you can um, use for this but I just find this this one works really really well and we'll just start trying to get some of the um, some of the muck off here Basically, we're literally just making it so it's going to be more pleasant for us to um, to work with. We're not going to uh, try and get it spotless at this stage. Like I said, we really just want to get what well, this is. Remember, back when this house, well, no, not this house. Back when this TV was new, just about everyone had a coal fire, um, and this is the this is the result. This is just residue from many many years of um, being in a living room with um, a coal fire it does show though there's a very good chance like I said that this set has never really been worked on by anyone there we go that's the most of that I mean we'll probably get a brighter image off the CRT just by doing that and then we can start really just getting as much of the dust as we possibly can off just moisten my um... in fact I might get my little paintbrush out as well because that's going to help where are your little paintbrush This is a really useful thing when you're working on um, these old TVs and radios. It's just a little half inch paintbrush and I've cut the bristles down so they're only um, about three quarters of an inch deep. And it's great for getting in places like this and just getting some of the, some of the dust away. So all we're trying to do is just make the set at the moment a little bit uh, more presentable for us to work on. Because at the moment, every time we touch it, it's just getting muck everywhere. And that's not nice to work on, really. You know. Start turning the set round. So you'll get an idea. 
it's totally complete. Uh, I can't see a single valve missing or anything like that. As you can see here. Now one thing, um, this is just a note of caution for um, people that haven't worked on old valve stuff before. When you're cleaning, whatever you do, don't be tempted to wipe over where the um, valve printing is there because it will just wipe straight off the valve on a lot of these valves, especially the old mullards and stuff like that. I said the um, there's no problem cleaning the valves, but avoid wiping over where the print on the valve is because like I say it'll just wipe off with a um, damp cloth. But we'll just we'll take some of the muck off the top so we can take them out and clean them properly after. We are literally just trying to minimise the amount of dust at the moment so when um, we actually delve a bit deeper into this we're not getting filthy dirty with it and the whole set has got like this thick film film all over it try and get some of the dust off the line output transformer here this is very very dusty You could do this outside with a um, an airline if you had one and a compressor, but personally, I'd rather not for the simple um, fact that you do risk perhaps dislodging um, some of the very fine wires on a coil or on um, even if um, some parts are weak, you could blow a resistor off um, out of position. I would rather just go around with a little uh, paintbrush like this and just see if we can get rid of as much of the. Um, initial dirt as possible and dust said so we're literally just making it so it's a little bit you know, be a little bit more presentable for us to um, work on but it's really nice when you see them like this because you know no one else has been in here messing or if they have it's not been for you know, many 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 years and with the amount of dust in this I'm pretty sure it was probably working um, up until when it was actually stored because um, no one's been in here and cleaned all the dust off done some work on it and then you'll not had it running again not by the look of it anyway one thing we're going to have to do is um, probably clean all the valve sockets we'll be taking the valves out we'll have um, a proper clean round Well, that's going to be in um, a later video on this. So in this initial video we're just going to give it a really basic clean and we'll do some first initial tests. We probably won't go in actually and try and clean up all the valve bases until probably after we've got first light on it. But we do need to get <coughs> just for my um, my sanity with the dust, we do need to get rid of some of it beforehand. One issue we may have actually is um, it does use a lot of these EF50s and the holders, the valve holders that these EF50s are in are quite notorious for um, having iffy contacts in them. So we may have to go in there and um, have a look at them. Like I said, we will find all that out after we've um, done our first initial power up. Just dampen that up and we'll just see if we can get some of this muck off the um, CRT. You do have to be very, very careful around these um, CRTs as well. Because when it's out of the cabinet like this, there is no implosion protection whatsoever on this, um, on this CRT. And see how filthy it is. Um, it is a potential um, small bomb, really, or well, implosion device, anyway. I mean, you're fine if you treat them with respect, but whatever you do, you can't go banging these CRTs around. I said they are, um, they are potentially quite dangerous. Saying that, I did have um, an even earlier CRT like this. Um, sat in a cardboard box on a towel in the um, corner of my bedroom for about 10 years and, um, and that never blew up on me.
Well, like I said we're just trying to get as much of this muck off as we can. Oops, that was just the uh, grounding strip I just caught there with my finger. This I don't know if this is the original tube or not. It's um, does appear to have an aqua dag coating on it. That's another thing we can't rub on it too hard, or we will rub the um, we'll actually rub the dag coating um, off the CRT. We just want to give it a light clean, just to like I said, we just try to get rid of the worst of that dust off it. We're not scrubbing it clean because so basically it has a coat. It's called dag. Um, Basically, it's like a metalised coating on the outside of the CRT, um, which goes to ground. And this is what forms um, basically the outside of the CRT. There forms a capacitor. Um, could do with getting this off from round here because that could cause a bit of flashing. Basically, where I'm pointing round here, this is where the um, anode cap. Comes, this is the um, EHT comes along here into the CRT now on more modern CRTs you'd have like a rubber cup that fits over this and um, your dag coating there's a layer round there where there is no dag coating so obviously you've not got a short circuit and what we've got we've got a build up of grease and grime and stuff round there we really need to clean that off Otherwise, we've got a potential of when we've got a high voltage coming along here, it could actually, through all that muck and rubbish there, flash over onto the dag coating. And obviously, that's not desirable in the set. Um, so, as we're working around this, we will clean. In fact, I might get a Q-tip and something a bit more, um, a bit better, and we'll have a bit of a clean round there. We'll just try and get some of this muck and rubbish off around the um, around the CRT there. use. I've got a little bit of WD here, that's probably going to work quite well. Spray some onto there. Soak a Q-tip in it. We'll just see if this can remove this oil here. So we're just going to do this now then we don't forget and it will help when we go for that initial first power up because obviously we don't want to be losing um, high voltage through um, a shark a short sorry you need all the high voltage to actually go into the um, into the CRT it is very very dirty around here I've got to admit, I haven't actually worked on a vintage television in probably over 10 years. Like I, say, I do have a lot of them, but um, I collected most of mine in the early 2000s and, and a little bit before. I think I got my first one in the late 90s. Uh, but I really started collecting um, in the early 2000s and probably did most of my restorations between 2004 and 2008 and then I, I got more back into vintage computers to be fair um, and I haven't really done a great deal with um, vintage tele like TVs like I said for around about 10 years now but I do keep thinking you know it's not it's not as though I've completely given up on the hobby or anything it's just you know I started um, playing more with the vintage computers uh, but I've got an idea. I've got ideas to mix the two mix the two hobbies together. Actually, I've just watched something really interesting um, on YouTube. One of Ben Heck's projects, where he's using one of these tiny little microcontrollers and turning it into a um, video game. And he's basically um, bashing out the um, composite signal using the microcontroller. And I was looking at it, and I was thinking that code would be incredibly easy to modify to allow that um, little microcontroller to output a 405 line video signal which is what these old um, televisions output, um, input. Um, these don't work on 625 lines which is 
the standard analog uh, video signal that most people are used to. These run on what um, was the old British standard, which is 405 lines. And to actually get these to work uh, nowadays, you need you need a piece of equipment called the standards converter. Now I do have a uh, I do actually have a standards converter, so we can actually get this tele to work and put basically any modern signal, um, providing we can get um, get a composite out of it. Um, we can input it into my standards converter and get it to display on this TV. So I mean, there's no problem. Was uh, we could connect an Xbox up to it and play Xbox games on it. It's just that the standards converter would um, downscale the um, 625 line composite video standard down to um, a 405 line. Um, well, black and white, obviously, because all these sets are black and white, but a um, black and white video sa um, signal. And it also, um, the standards converter also um, converts it to a um, line, a. Um, RF frequency that the um, television can actually input. Um, like I said on this, it's the um, old Birmingham frequencies. But what I was thinking, like I said, what I was thinking with that um, little micro processor project that Ben Hex working on, I could get, I could actually perhaps make a pong game or something like that using a similar kind of idea. Um, but it would be a 405 line pong game specifically to run on these um, vintage TVs. Now I'd have to come up with a way of feeding that signal into the TV because obviously that's a composite signal and none of these old TVs actually have a composite input like I said there's a um, it's RF um, there are, these are actually TRF sets so they're set to one um, tuned frequency one for um, audio and one for video but that's not insurmountable we could make a little um, VHF modulator. It's, I think it's VHF frequency, but it's AM modulated the um, audio and video on these. Like I say, I am a little bit rusty. It's like I say, it's over ten years since I really did a lot of work on um, this four or five line stuff. That really is dirty around there. But that's come off. That's that's a lot better. I think we'll get away with that. We'll clean that up now. But no, I think that could be really quite a cool, fun little project. Make a, um, a little um, Pong style video game just for um, 405 line televisions. Well, that would definitely be in the future. Just something like I said, just watching that Ben Hex um, video the other night where he's um, messing with that little micro um, controller. I thought, ooh, that does. Um, that does prick my interest somewhat. Right, that, that's better, we'll get away with that. Like I said, we've not got um, too much worry about if we do have a nice 10 kV on that, it, um, worrying to flash over through all that muck and rubbish that was there. We'll carry on just giving the, we'll give the yoke a really gentle clean. So we don't want to go mad, we just want to see if we can get rid of as much of the um, just loose dust as we can, just to make the set easier to handle and work on. That's the focus and uh, focus control there. Again, it is really, really, really dusty, which makes me think that no one's messed with this set in a very, very, very long time. <gasps> Just blow a bit of the dust out that way. Yeah, this is really is. Now, that's interesting. I don't think that could be original but that looks like um, someone may have added that because them um, valve sockets under there were uh, causing issues I'll, I'll have a look on the on the manual and see if it mentions a piece of wood holding them two valves down if not that could have been done by some enterprising um, TV engineer you know, 50 years ago I mean, this set is what? <gasps> this set's 71 years old now. Let me get some of these.
Ooh. There we go, that's better. You can actually start seeing some of it now. Let's have a look at the back of the CRT, because that can tell us a lot. In fact, first check we should be making now. See, actually, we've, see if we've actually got some continuity on the heater pin on the um, CRT, because that's going to tell us whether this CRT is actually going to be of any use to us whatsoever or not. And what other thing I will do is I'll just get a bit of stuff on there. And we'll just give the glass around the CRT neck a quick clean. And hopefully we will still see that the getter inside's okay. And if the getter inside's still there, at least we know that the CRT's still got a vacuum. And I can tell, yeah, there's, um, I can see the getter stain on the um, side of the CRT here. So the good news is, it does look like we've still got a, um, a vacuum inside the CRT. So at least the CRT has not gone down to air. Uh, that, uh, uh, incidentally, is the Ferranti that I've got in my living room, the other set that I have on display. That's the problem with that um, TV. Um, I did try, again, that's a set that I have um, done work on in the past. Um, and unfortunately, the, uh, it's got a, what's known as a metal-backed CRT in it. It's actually very much um, like the old World War II radar tubes. And... Um, they had a basically they weren't designed to last 70 years and um, there's a bit of an imperfect seal between the um, glass front and the metal cone on the back and they go down to air and that's what's happened with that one um, so basically the CRT is no good in it and um, because it's um, it essentially is a radar tube it's got a very flat front on it and I haven't yet found a CRT the right size with a flat enough front to actually fit in the cabinet. Although I've found one electrical which will work on the set. Unfortunately, I can't mount it in the cabinet, so there's not much use using it. That's one of the main reasons why I'm working on this one rather than uh, that Franti. The Franti is actually one I would really, really like to get going. But like I said, the problem is that, um, that CRT in it. So we might as well play with the pie because it's a little it's a little bit easier to work on. It's a little bit more conventional as well. The front is a little bit um little bit oddball. Right. What we will do. Oh, I will mention as well, just to make life easier. Um I actually photocopied all the pages um, relevant to this TV. Um in my uh, Molly and Pool TV servicing book, so rather than um, getting my grubby hands all over them nice books that I've got, I've got these, I can draw on them, we can get fingerprints on them and everything, and um, it's not a problem. Right. I think first things first is we should see if we can figure out which... Um, which pins are the heater pins on the CRT and we'll just make sure we've got continuity on them. Like I said, there's not much far, much point going any further with that CRT if the um, heater's bad in it. So we can just put, try it with continuity. And there we go, straight away. Brilliant. Just make sure we haven't got any other shorts. No, so our bottom two there, that's the um, heater. And we've got about three ohms there, which is pretty much bob on right for the um, heater continuity. So, first, um, basically the first basic check I wanted to do is a win. We actually do have heater continuity. So we still don't know if we've got any emission left on that CRT, but at least, like I said, the heater will light and we should at least be able to get something um, on the um, on the CRT, we can get the rest of the set to actually um, function. What I think we'll do now is we'll um, we'll pop it on its side and we can have a quick look underneath. I said on here everything is in place. I can't see anything missing. There's no valves missing. Everything's there. That does slightly concern me. Like I say it does make me think that there's possibly um, one of them valve holders has a very bad contact on it. 
we will very gently stand the set up like that and we can have a quick let me just see if I can get you up on the um, right there we go we'll zoom you in a little bit if we can there we go right ah straight away we do know something we have Birmingham marks on the bottom of the chassis there so this is a um, BV20 rather than an LV20 so from now on we know we are working on a um, pipe BV20 so this is the Birmingham version um, as you can see it is actually rather complex under here uh, there are a lot of capacitors um, essentially we've got um, quite a lot of electrolytic capacitors that's our main smoother in the middle there I believe the reason it has that holder there is because um, it actually mentions in the service notes that depending on what voltage you was running on um, you actually had to add an extra capacitor to compensate because back when this was made um, the UK had many different voltages all over the country and some were AC some were DC and the A, even the AC wasn't standardized uh, there was such a thing I think this was probably down the Birmingham way as where you had um, 240 volts AC at 30 Hertz not 50 Hertz um, and it actually does mention that if you're on a 240 volt AC 30 Hertz supply that you have to actually include an uh, extra capacitor in the set to compensate for the um, lower line frequency there's lots of interesting things for when this tel television was made like I said the, we didn't have the national grid as it is now and every area did have their own different type of electricity really anyway just quick look under here it, again I don't think this telly's has ever been worked on I can't see any parts that have been changed up to now um, it looks really really good We've actually got a date there as well on that main um, smoothing capacitor. December um, 49. So I think this television was made in um, December 1949. It's quite fitting that it's de December 2020 and we're um, going to attempt to get this thing working again. So we might be able to get this working for its um, 71st birthday. That's, yeah, that's, um, that's going to be quite nice. But there's going to be a lot of work to do under here. Um, essentially what I'm going to have to do before we can even try and power this thing up um, I'm not going to be changing every capacitor in it uh, what I am going to be changing are basically decoupling capacitors where it, you've got a capacitor which is going to ground because those are what those that basically they're going to go leaky um, they're the ones that are going to cause um, problems because they're going to pull the HT to um, ground they're going to stop things working um, looking at the circuit diagram we do have quite a lot of capacitors to change in this set actually um, I've worked on later sets than this and they've actually not had quite as much um, capacitor wise to actually worry about as this set does but um, yeah it's really going to be a case of going through it um, find identifying um, decoupling capacitors and basically capacitors that have got HT on them but are going um, or at least a high voltage but are um, then taking that to the um, ground the, the decoupling it to ground because if they've gone leaky like I said oh, they're going to get hot they're going to um, probably possibly go pop but they're also going to be pulling the um, high tension down and not allowing the rest of the set to actually start up and as we really need what basically what we want to do is get the high frequency side of this working first we've got to make sure that we've actually got the high tension there to be able to drive the valves to get the high frequency working to get the EHT there to actually see whether the CRT is going to um, do anything I mean, in in the same process we're actually going to test that the actual EHT transformer works now I believe they're actually as EHT transformers in vintage sets goes the ones in these pies are actually fairly reliable they don't seem to fail and go as ro go 
wrong as much as some of the um, other sets of, of this era. Um, Bush TV 22 for one. Um, they're quite notorious for having rather flaky line output transformers in them. Um, and they're also a very popular set to um, collect. Um, I've got a couple myself actually. Um, these pies, however, did have a much more robust line output transformer in them, so I'm hopefully I'm hoping that that's going to be fairly um, fairly okay in it. Like I said, I'm not too worried about a lot of the electrolytics at the moment. Um, the main smoother, uh, we'll check it out. It's probably bad. Um, to be fair, in most of these sets that I've worked on that main smoother is no good anymore and uh, we'll need swapping out um, a lot of these other capacitors, um, a lot of these metal cased ones we're actually going to just test because um, many of these are actually still, to believe in considering they're over 70 years old or getting on for 70 years old, they're still actually usually okay um, the wax paper capacitors are, on the other hand we're probably going to end up changing most of them um, these will only end up changing if they actually prove, prove to be a problem. Um, apart from that, like I said, I'm really pleased that the set's actually in quite um, quite nice, quite unmolested condition. Um, one issue we may have, and I remember I have previously restored a um, Pi LV30, which is um, a later version of a very similar set. And one of the problems I had on that, and this set has the same same arrangement. Just get you down a touch. There we go. Is these controls here? Um, they're basically a slight. They're a variable resistor, basically, um, and they control you know uh, brightness, uh, vision stability, frame uh, frame linearity. In fact, these are are moving. Yeah, we can actually move these ones, but these have a tendency to freeze in place and stop and stop being able to be adjusted. That one's frozen. That one's frozen. That one's frozen. That one's well, that's got a bit of movement in it. Yeah, that one's okay. What we might do before we start working on this, I've got a little bit of WD. And I'm going to just give each one of these a tiny little soak. Before we even start messing about with him, and get the excess of that off. Like that's cleaned all that up really nicely and hopefully that penetrating oil will get in there and hopefully it will allow them to free off the other problem that happens with them is because they're basically they're based on a wire wound resistor we go back in and have a look on the other side we look on the back of them here um, let me see if I can get you around so you can see that you're not going to see that very well there are you Turn the camera. Oops. Well, basically, if you look here, um, the wire wound resistors with a little slider on them. So when you move the control, it moves a little wiper on the um, wire wound resistor. And the wire wound resistors on them do tend to um, go open circuit. And no, the LV30 I worked on. At least I think it was three of them had failed, and I actually ended up having to mount more more modern, more standard wire wound resistors elsewhere on the chassis to actually replace the ones in there that had failed. But um, hopefully, adding that little bit of WD might at least help us give us some chat. Yeah, that one that wasn't moving before. There, that now works. So that should have helped helped out from that respect. That one's still... oh no, look! That's now moving as well. Yeah, so we've managed to free them off. 
So hopefully if they're um Hopefully if the um actual wire on the wire wound part of it is still um good and they're not open circuit they will actually all function on this one which would be really nice like I said because on the Pi LV30 um, that I worked on I end up having to replace half of them like with standard uh, just turn wire wound pots just to get it working anyway um, yeah that is a basic overview of the chassis so I think in the next um, in the next video what we're going to do is we're going to look at perhaps just changing the very very bare minimum of the capacitors that we need to change in this um, to safely power it up and um, after we've done that I think we're going to um, I don't know if it's bring it up on the Variac or um, just give it some power I think we'd be safer actually uh, just bringing it up on the Variac um, just make sure there's nothing nasty or we can bring it up to um, bring it up to our operating voltage and actually like I said hopefully we can see if we can get a um, raster on the screen if we can get a raster on the screen we may even go as far as um, looking at feeding a signal into it probably not from my um, standards converter um, straight off but I have a um, a rather vintage um, television signal generator that's actually from this era it's a very very primitive pattern generator um, but it will at least show us that the rest of the sets actually um, in some form of working order and then we can work through it and hopefully get it to the stage where we can actually get a decent um, like I said, a decent picture on it, we can get it back in the cabinet and um, watch some TV or Christmas on it anyway I'm going to leave it there for now I um, hope you enjoyed this um, little part two and hopefully uh, part three should be coming reasonably soon. I should have enough capacitors actually in stock to do this. So um, it's only um, a case of when I um, when I have some time and I can sit up here and um, have a fiddle. But um, like I said, hopefully I um, should have another video out on this um, pretty soon and we can um, crack on with the project. So uh, thanks for watching and goodbye.